Amen, amen. Happy Sabbath, church. Come on, you can talk back to the preacher. Happy Sabbath, church. Amen. I'm excited to be here at the Church of the Oranges. So excited to be here. Um, so I want to thank your elder for the kind introduction. I know that most people cannot say my name, so I'm going to say it to you guys. And when i outside reading the people, whoever can say it back to me, I'm going to give you a nice hug. Amen? My name is, are you all ready? Tinashe Mukorombindo. Say back, say back. See, y'all got it. Amen. Put your hands together. Amen. 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 I just want to thank your senior pastor, Dr. Stutter, for the opportunity to be here, to stand behind the sacred desk. I want to also acknowledge his wife. I was told that she's in, the pre she's in the building. His wife, is she here? Is she here? She's still outside. I just want to acknowledge the first lady of this church. I also want to acknowledge my beautiful fiance who's with me here today. I want to say thank you so much for coming with me. We appreciate you, and I love you so much. Amen, amen. If you will stand to your feet as we get ready to read the word of God. Turn your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 7, verses 6 to 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 to 13. And when you have it, say amen. Amen. We can wait. We can wait. Okay, I see it on the screen. And the word of God reads, So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But when the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at, the, or at his physical statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see man, does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So Jesse said, called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. Shammah passed by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? Then he said, there yet remains the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. Verse 12 says, so he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took his horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. For the next few moments, I'd like to preach, talk to you under the title, When God Chooses You. Come on, say somebody, say, When God Chooses You, you may be seated in the presence of God. It was on this particular day, December 2, 2002, that my family and I sat around the television set. We sat with excitement to see this particular kid from Akron, Ohio, this kid that everybody had been talking about. Everyone was talking about him. Rappers were rapping about him. People were talking about him. As a matter of fact, at that moment, in that specific time, my uncle, my cousins, and my brothers were so excited to see this kid from high school who was playing on national television, ESPN. They were excited because everybody had been saying good things about this kid. Everybody had declared that this kid was going to be the next, if not, Michael Jordan. They had said that because of his gifts, his talents, that he was bound to be better than Kobe Bryant himself. Now... My uncle, a man who has seen Michael Jordan play live, I was surprised to hear him say such a thing. And I, as a, as, because of what he said, I expected big things out of this kid. 
And the truth of the matter is, it wasn't just him who believed that. Two hours before the game started, three commentators stood behind the television set and said three things that really caught my attention. One said, this kid has the nature of Kobe Bryant, killer instinct of Michael Jordan. And this kid has the ability to make everybody around him better, just like Michael Jack Michael J Magic Johnson. This kid that they were talking about was LeBron James. LeBron James, a few months after that game, he he was appointed. He was um, he was placed in the um the, uh, he was placed in an article in Sports Illustrated. And in the article, before you open even to the article, the front of the magazine, Sports Illustrated, had LeBron James on the magazine. And on the magazine was LeBron James flexing with his back towards the cameraman. And what the that tattoo that he had said, simply read as such, chosen one. LeBron was the chosen one. Everybody liked him. His family loved him. People recognized his gifts. People saw what he could do. People knew what he could be. People could already declare that this dude, this kid from Akron, Ohio, was going to be somebody, maybe even better than Kobe Bryant or better than Michael Jordan, if not the next one. And brothers and sisters, I wish I could stand up here today and tell you that the same was, like, was for David. I wish I could tell you that David was as loved by his family as LeBron was. I wish I could tell you that David was loved, endorsed, supported, and loved by everybody around him. I wish I could tell you that people saw David and said that that young man has something special about him. I wish I could tell you right now that David was loved and approved of even by his own father, brothers, and those around him. But the truth is I can't because his family didn't appreciate him. His family could not see a can I see more than just a sheep boy? And I know that there are some people in here who can relate to David. You can understand how David feels because you know what it's like to have a gift in you, but nobody acknowledging it. You know what it's like to have something in you, to know that you can do this, but the people around you don't even believe in you. You know what it's like to be in your family, to be around people, to be popular, but yet still feel alone or not supported. You know what it's like to have people just look down upon you, not because you've done anything wrong, just based off the, fact, the way that you look. But brothers and sisters, I'm happy and I'm so excited because I love how David and the Bible, how it teaches that, the story of David teaches us that. Even when people oppose you, look down upon you, God will still elevate you. The story of David teaches us the favor of men doesn't matter. What people think about you doesn't matter. What people say about you doesn't matter because it's all about what God thinks about you. And when God has chosen you, appointed you, and anointed you, can't no man knock you down. Come on, somebody say Amen. And I'm talking to the youth, the elderly, anybody in here who God has placed a special anointing that you don't have to worry about what other people think. God chose you. You don't have to worry about what your family thinks. God chose you. I also love that the story of David teaches us that it's not about your ability to do something. It's not about being black or white. It's not about being a man or woman. It's not about being a child or an elderly person, but it's about your availability to God. The truth is, if you are available to God, you might not have the gift, you might not have the talent, but if God has already chosen you, God will equip you, but you all, all you got to do is be available to God. So the question now becomes, what do you do when God has chosen you but man has rejected you. How do you go about doing what God has chosen you to do when people don't see anything in you? The first thing you must do, the first thing you must do is not allow people, people's opinions, people's view of you to make you think that you're not chosen by God. 
You must not allow people's view of you, people's opinions, to make you think that God thinks the same way as you. Because the truth of the matter is, your value does not decrease based on someone's inability to see your worth. The story says, God goes up to Samuel and says, Samuel, get up. I know that you've been a moaning over Saul, whom I've rejected. I want you to get up and go to Jesse in Bethlehem because I've chosen the next king of Israel. Samuel and God have a discussion. They work it out. They have a little plan going on. Samuel goes to Bethlehem. The elders of the town see him. They fear a little bit. He tells them, don't worry. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. So take up yourselves. Call the people. And he goes to Jesse and says, bring you and your sons so that I may consecrate Consecrate each of one of you, and we can go and sacrifice. Samuel, tell, Jesse tells his sons, come now so that, I can, so that we can go and be sacrificed. Jesse takes his sons, key phrase, Jesse takes his sons, goes up to the sacrifice, goes up and gets consecrated, which is the, gets cleaned up and then consecrated. The first thing that you must understand is when you're being consecrated, you have to wash yourself, which means that they go and they take a bath, they clean up, they do all that it takes so that you can find yourself presentable in the eyes of the Lord. Then Samuel then consecrates them spiritually, which is praying over them, making sure that their sins are taken care of. And then the next step is to go to the sacrifice. Jesse now takes his sons to the sacrifice. And here they are. We're in our key text. Jesse and Samuel are now picking, are now talking, and God is speaking to Samuel, and God is saying, within these sons, seven sons, in the Bible says, there's a, there's a, there's a king of Israel that I'm going to pick. Jesse now realizes what is happening, because he sees that Samuel is doing something special. There's no way a prophet of God can come into our presence, and he just asks specifically me and them to come. So now Samuel is speaking to God, and God says, within these, I'm going to show you who the next king. Jesse brings out Eliab. Eliab, who is mature, he's a handsome, sexy man. He's, he's got it. He's got the muscles. He's got the statue. He's got the hair. And Samuel, in his mind, he's like, that is him. That's him. He looks like it. He's fit to be a king. Nobody's not going to step up to him like some, some, some little punk. But God says, I've rejected him because I don't look at the heart. I look at what's inside. Samuel, Jesse then brings up the second one, Abinadab. And God says, no, that's not the one. And then Jesse then brings up the third one, who's Shama. And you would think that God would choose Shama because Shama's name means God is there. But God says, no. And then he goes for the fourth one goes for the fifth one, goes for the sixth one. And then you will also think that God will pick the seventh one. Because as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that God has something, has a little liking or loves the number seven. But God says, no, that's not it. Now watch this, watch this. The scene says, Samuel then asks Jesse, are these all the young men here? Jesse then responds and says, eh. There's another one, but he's just a sheep boy. See, he's over there. He's just right there. Samuel says, bring him in, for we will not sit until he comes. Parents, if I could say this one thing to you, be careful of how you treat your children, how you speak to your children, and how you act around your children. Because what Jesse did not understand is that a few years later, when they see Jesus, people would have been saying, son of David, oh, have mercy on me. What Jesse did not understand was that David was going to be the one writing some of the books in the Bible. So what Jesse did not understand is that the anointing of David's life was so powerful that he was destined to do great things that he missed it. The scene says that Jesse now brings David, and God goes up and tells him, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel looks at David and says, He's rooting. He's a little, which means he's just a childlike. He has a childlike presence. 
He's not necessarily a man of physique. He's not necessarily a man who has um, um, a commanding presence. But God says, arise and anoint him. And what I want you to know, why it's so important not to allow how people think of you, is because God doesn't anoint David in the presence of his brothers and his fathers, not just to, not to spite at his brothers, but he anoints David in the presence of his brothers to let him know that it doesn't matter what they think about you. You are my child. It doesn't matter how they view you. You've got an anointing. And I know this because the Bible says that when, he, when God tells Jeremiah, when God declares Jeremiah's um, calling on his life. He says, before I knew thee, before I formed thee, I knew thee. Before I've done anything, I already knew you. And you've got to be careful of how oftentimes we treat nobodies because the God that we serve specializes in turning nobodies into somebodies. And we know that for a fact. We know that for a fact. Because it says so in Jeremiah. As a matter of fact, nobody is a nobody in God's eyes. Nobody is a nobody in God's eyes. Don't get it twisted. You might not look like what they think you should look like, but you are somebody. You are somebody. Come on, talk to me. You are somebody in the eyes of God. My God. And what I love about the text is that David is not too far off. And we know this because of the, what um, Jesse says to Samuel. There he is, keeping the sheep. And what I love about God is God would do certain things in a special way to show you that you are my son and that you are chosen. The Bible says that. He says, bring him, but we will not sit until he comes. And then he anoints him. Watch this. The sons of Jesse, the seven first sons, were anointed. They were cleaned up and consecrated. David comes with his smelly self, smelling like sheep poo, with, is not cleaned up, is not consecrated, and yet he's anointed. And what God is trying to tell us is that I don't need to go and use human standards to show you that you're my son. I don't, you don't need to follow humanity standards to know that you are chosen. You don't need humanity standards to know that you are anointed. I will anoint you however I want to anoint you. I will do what I want to do however I want to do. God affirms David that your value is not based on what people think, but it's based on what I think. And because you are a child of God, that carries weight. You're not just a child of somebody. You are a child of God. The God, mm, my God. The Bible says, the Bible says he's anointed. And then Samuel leaves. The next scene is that David is now summoned to the king's palace. He's summoned to the king's palace because the king has been dealing with this demon, this demon that won't leave. And we know that David has the anointing of God. We know that David is so anointed by God. How? Because David doesn't have to speak to cast out the demon. David doesn't have to pray to cast out the demon. David doesn't have to do anything but play. He just plays. And that's how you know when somebody's anointed. And I'm wondering if there are any anointed people in this place that even when they get in the midst of demons and all they, have, they don't have to speak it, but their presence in the midst of demons will make the demons flee. And I'm wondering if those, if, if we are so anointed too often in the church, we're so critical about too many things. We like to talk. We like to have a little fun, gossip, make lies about people. But when you are anointed, people ought to change their characters when they're near you. People ought to be, when you come in the presence of people doing evil, people ought to stop and say, this is a man of God. I can't do this. The demons ought to flee. Evil ought to flee. You know your anointing based on how people act around you. Or do you carry evil? Or do you flee, make evil flee from you? David is so anointed by God that evil flees from him. David is so anointed by God that God has placed such a special thing on him that all he has to do is play. Can you imagine that? Calling somebody to pray over you and all he has to do is come into his presence, your presence and play, do what they're called to do. Brothers and sisters in Christ, 
We are to be anointed. We are to so carry the anointed of God so heavy that everywhere we go, people ought to see that anointment. The next scene in our story says that David and Goliath are about to fight. We all know the story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath are about to fight. But before that, we have, da- we have um, Goliath hurling out and shouting out insults to people. And he's, he, David and the Philistines are shouting out insults to people. And the, Phil- the Israelite army keeps backing up because they're fearful of what um, Goliath could do. They see Goliath as an obstacle, as a human obstacle, because they see Goliath as this person whom cannot be defeated. God, guys, my youth, where my youth at? Raise your hand. I need my youth to raise their hand. Come on, come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand. David is so anointed by God that God places him in a special place to do something extraordinary. Men in the army are fearing Goliath. But we know the story of David, that David is anointed to be the one to slay Goliath. But watch this. That when we read the story of David and Goliath, it says that they haul not insults, they yell not things, the army is fearful. David is now sent by his father, Jesse, to bring some food to the brothers and to check up on them. The way the story is inserted in the Bible, it's a little random. It's only two verses out of the whole thing. It goes from the war scene to Jesse speaking to David and then goes back to the war scene. And what the Bible is trying to tell us is that be careful of how you treat small assignments. Be careful of how you view small assignments. Because David is not given this big assignment, this big celebration. His father says, David, take this food and go see how your brothers are doing. Too often, we're so caught up in titles and positions that when we're offered what seems small to us, we say no because we believe that we're worthy of a big position. But God is trying to tell you, your small position to human standards is big in my standards. Be careful of how you view small things because God will use small things to do big things through you. You might be just a deacon, but there's a lot that a deacon does. Without this church, the deacon is, without deacons, this church cannot run properly. You might even not even have a title because David doesn't have a title. His brothers have a title. There's soldiers in the army, but David doesn't. But we know how the story ends, right? Amen. The scene continues. Chapter 17, that David now comes and he gives his brothers the food. And now he's wandering around the camp, seeing what's going on. He hears Goliath yelling and hurling out these um, this insults. David, in his mind, this childlike, hears this man yelling out these insults. And he sees the army of the living God. Becoming so fearful, David now begins to talk to a soldier and inquire what's going on. And he tells him, and he even tells him the reward. But David then says to himself, wait a minute, who dares comes against the army of the living God? This child is saying this to, the, to a soldier. This child who's not been trained in the army is saying this to a soldier. This child who's, been trained, who's not been trained in the army, this child who's saying this to a man, says, who dares come against the army of the living God? Too often in our churches, we have men, but we don't have spiritual men. We have women, but we don't have enough spiritual women. Because they see a man who's an obstacle, but David sees this, who is this? trying to come against the army of the living God. David says, who dares come against the army of the living God? Oftentimes, we believe that we're dealing with physical obstacles in our life. 
We treat our addictions, our physical inabilities, the things that we go through, our situations as a physical. But what you're failing to understand, that it's not a physical battle. It's a spiritual battle. Some of us came into 2016 saying that I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do this. But we failed to say that with God, I'm going to do this. And I know that I will conquer because the spirit of the living God lives in me. And we face our battles and we fail because we're trying to operate based on humanity. We see our obstacles. We see people dealing with cigarettes. Some of you are dealing with sexual problems. But we're trying to stop. Some of us dealing with gossip, lying, whatever it is you're dealing with. You're trying to stop doing that, but yet you can't. It's because you're doing it wrong. You can't get into the boxing ring with Satan. You're no match to Satan. But what you know you need to do is get on your knees and pray. Ask for the spirit of the living God to do something in you. You Stop fighting your, your spiritual battles physically. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the battle is the Lord's. Give it to God. David sees this Goliath. As a spiritual enemy, not as a physical enemy. And he he says, who dares come against the army of the living God? The soldier who's with David is encouraged because he sees this Rudy-like boy speaking with such power and such authority, with such boldness. And he begins to talk and spread the word around. And we know that because later in the text it says that Saul hears them. But watch what the enemy does. The enemy sends Eliab, who's the firstborn, who believes that he should have gotten it. Because Eliab is a physical, good-looking one. He's the one who looks like a king, supposed to be the king. He sends Eliab, and Eliab says, begins to talk to David. What are you doing here? What are you doing here, David? Who did you leave those two sheep with? I know your pride. I know your heart. The enemy sends Eliab to discourage David. Because he knew what God was about to do. And check this out. Satan sends Eliab, who is David's brother, to discourage him. The devil will send things in your way. It might even come from your family. It might come from those who love you. It might come from those who you trust. People will do things and say things to you. But that's just the enemy. Eliab believes that he's supposed to get it first. And I can understand why, because in my culture, African culture, everything goes to the firstborn. I have an older brother. If my father was to die, his inheritance first goes, the biggest one goes to him, and then little by little, it's spread down. And Eliab believes that I'm the one who's supposed to get this. Because Eliab is looking at his physical, and too many of us are looking at our titles, are looking at our credentials. I'm Dr. So-and-so. I'm so-and-so. I deserve to be this. And God is saying, it don't matter what you are. I'm God. What you going to say to me? When I choose somebody, I'm not choosing them based on credentials. I already knew him before I formed him. Stop getting discouraged when people with titles come up to you and put you down. You ought never to be put down by anybody. You are somebody. Your title is child of the king. That's it. You might not be Dr. So and so. You can listen. When you go and introduce yourself, I want you to do this. They say, Hi, how are you? What's your name? Child of the King Tinashe. You can call yourself Dr. So-and-so. I'm child of the king, Tanashe. You don't need credentials to do what God has called you to do. Do what God called you to do. And that brings me to the second point. Trust in what God has equipped you with. Stop trying to do what everybody else is doing. The scene says Saul is now talking. He hears. The scene says Saul hears some... Um, uh, soldiers around the camp because it's, the word is going around that David has said this, who dares come against the army of the living God, and they're encouraged. And Saul is like, bring this person. He sees David and sees this Rudy, which means childlike, and he says, who are you to try and go against Goliath? This is a man of war. 
Look at you and look at him. Look at his resume. What do you have? Trust in what God has equipped you with. David now speaks up to the king. I'm sure David stands up and he approaches the king and he says, hold up. I know you think I'm a little child, but I've done some things that even yourself couldn't do. I've killed a bear with my bare hands. I've killed a lion with my bare hands. Can you do that? And David then says to him, I didn't do that by my own might. I did it with what God has equipped me with. I didn't fight this thing. I didn't fight this thing with my physical sword. I fought this thing with the, uh, with the power of God. Saul still is not convinced because when you're dealing with, un um, with um, unconvinced people, people who don't listen to God, they'll never believe you. So Saul says, you know what? Fine. You know, fine. I'm going to, I'm going to allow you to go into battle. But before you go, you got to put this on. You got to put on the helmet. You got to put on the, 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 you got to take the sword, you got to take on the shield, you got to put on the shield, you know, all that stuff that he takes on. And too often we have read this story to believe that David was the underdog. Can I tell you that he was not? So it's kind of like this. It's like Dwight Howard. How many of y'all are basketball fans? It's like Dwight Howard going against Allen Iverson. We in New Jersey. Let me, let, me, let me give you some New Jersey people. Jason Kidd. Man, y'all team suck. <sighs> I can't think of nobody. Jason Kidd playing against Shaquille O'Neal. Who's faster? Jason Kidd. Shaq might be stronger, but who's slicker? Who can move to the left and to the right? Who can step back? Watch this. We thought David was the underdog. Because we see David as this little boy with the little um, thing to throw the rocks. But the truth of the matter is, David is not. Because watch this. History says that there are three types of warriors. How many warriors did I say? There's uh, the warrior who rides on the horse. There's a warrior who fights on the battlefield. And then there's a warrior who holds the arrows or the sling. David is not the underdog. For another reason being that. Goliath has all this armor. He has a shield. He has um, these shoes to protect him. He has a helmet. So Goliath is not able to run. Goliath fights face to face. David, and what, and David in what God has equipped, me, equipped him with, fights from a distance. We think that David is an underdog, but we fail to understand that the battle, the fight is not equal. Goliath has to fight face to face. David doesn't need to come that close. David, all he does is throw and aim. Goliath cannot do anything until he steps forth. Are y'all getting me? David throws and hits. Goliath has to come forth. And even when Goliath comes forth, it's still hard for him to fight. Because Goliath has to swing. And the swing, he has to they do that. And do that. All David has to do is throw him. And what I'm trying to tell you is, you think that you're an underdog because you have been given little. But you're failing to recognize that what God has equipped you with is enough to destroy the enemy. And here's the point I'm trying to make. We view prayer as this little thing. We don't recognize prayer and its power. Because we think prayer is this little thing. That's why Saul tries to put on this armor. And that's why people try and tell you, you've got to do this. You've got to do that. If you want to beat this, you've got to do that. you got to do this. First of all, pray. There's the power that David has. This little sling that he has was underestimated by people. Our sling, brothers and sisters in Christ, is our prayer. All we got to do is pray and aim. But the truth of the matter is, each day that you wake up, the enemy has already set out his plans. He's already set out his traps. He's already, Miss White says that when you go to sleep, there's an ongoing battle over you for the enemy to try and snatch your soul. The only way that we stay alive is by the power of God.
But the truth is, you can't go throughout the day without praying. Because if you think that you can beat the enemy by doing this and staying out of the club and doing that, you can't. You've got to pray first and ask God to give you the power to do what God is going to do. You don't know what the enemy is planned for you each day. God has so anointed each and every one of us. It doesn't matter whether you're a woman or a girl, a boy, all that stuff. It doesn't matter. God has chosen you to do something great in your life. David says to the king, I'm not going to fight with this armor. I don't know it. I'm going to use what God has given me. I'm going to trust in what God has given me. And even if I die, I'll die at least doing what God has told me to do. That ought to speak volumes. I would rather die doing what God has chosen me to do than die doing something I'm not supposed to do. I'd rather live in a poor life, struggling day to day, doing what God has chosen me to do than trying to seek pleasures in human things. I'd rather do what God has told me to do than do what man has sent me to do. David now goes on the battle. He swings his sling, hits Goliath. Goliath falls. David now slays the giant. And watch what happens. When you trust in what God has equipped you with, people will begin to look at you differently. Because the story says Saul sees David. This is really like the one who was like, who are you? You're just a child. You ain't got no experience. He sees David and says to his commander, who is this? Did y'all catch up? In his eyes, he's now seen, he's now like, what just happened? Who is this? The difference is because David's not fighting this battle physically, he's fighting it spiritually. And he's trusting in what God has equipped me with. He knows that God has placed in him and called him. That even though you might not believe me, I believe in myself because God believes in me. The third and final point that I want to leave you with is do what God has called you to do. Too often we wait for somebody else to do something that God called us to do. Too often we give complaints as to God, I don't have this or that. I need this to do it. God is saying, no, do what I've called you to do. And, 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 and the way God sets up David is in such a way that Everybody knows that this man is it. Because the Bible says, Jesse is called to get David. Samuel, it says, to, Samuel says to Jesse, Jesse, bring, send and bring him. For we will not sit down until he comes. This goes to tell us that some things will not happen until you are in your rightful place. You're waiting for the pastor to do it. God is saying you do it. Some things will not happen. People are still dying out there because we're waiting for somebody to do it. God is saying you do it. And what we often confuse this chosen, anointed thing is, God, I can't do that because I'm not a pastor or I don't have this. When you look in the Bible, Jesus was not a pastor. When you look in the Bible, Daniel was not a pastor. The three Hebrew boys, they were not even. What I'm trying to tell you is God will call you and use you in your position. You can be a nurse and still bring people to God. You can be a doctor. You can be a lawyer. You can be whatever you are. And young people, I want to tell you, do what God has called you to do. God will take care of you. God will give you his, your desires of your heart if you do what he has called you to do. Stop waiting on other people to do something. I remember, I remember when I first got to Oakwood, I wasn't always a theology major. I was never a theology major. As a matter of fact, I ran from the calling. I knew that God has called me since probably junior year in high school. I knew it, but I didn't want it. I said to God, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what I want, and what I want is to make money. So I'm going to go to Oakwood University, and I'm going to study what I want to study. 
Alvin can tell you. I went to Oakwood and I was a nurse major. Knowing, fully knowing that God said, you're not supposed to be here. And then after a semester, things got tough. And I was like, nah, this ain't for me. I already know that. But let me choose something that makes money, still makes money, but a little bit easier or something that I might enjoy. Something to do with sports. So I said, let me do physical therapy. I can go into sports. I can do this. And I still knew that God didn't want me there. And all the time, in the meantime, while people are shadowing doctors and doing all this, I'm out here in church being a Bible worker, being a pastoral intern, when I'm supposed to be doing stuff with physical therapy. I'm supposed to be doing what? I'm the things that I need to get into grad school. But I'm here talking about senior class chaplain. What you doing a senior class chaplain? It was later on, and one of the issues that I had with the call was that I felt inadequate. Because I said, God, I know you want me to do this, but I'm not adequate enough. I don't think that I've got it. I can't preach like so-and-so. And, you know, if you want me to sing, I can't sing like so-and-so. I don't have the physique like so-and-so. I don't speak like so-and-so. But God said, I'm not looking for you to be like so-and-so. I'm looking for you to be like you. Stop trying to live your life with your own standards and live in my will. And I said, but God, it's hard. And he said, Tanasha, before I formed you, I knew you. Therefore, if I know you, trust me, I've already... Before I formed you, I knew you. God knows who you're supposed to be already. Stop trying to be so-and-so and stop looking at other people. I can't preach like so-and-so. I can't do this. Do what I've called you. You don't need to have these qualifications. I'll qualify you. And the issue that I was having was that I was trying to get the qualifications without the anointing. And that's what often, too often we do. We're trying to get the qualifications for something without God's anointing. Let God anoint you. And let him do what he has desired for you to do, what he has desired you to do. I'm closing. I went to Oakwood University in 2009. Um, while I was in high school, uh, I played JV basketball. On this JV basketball, I was the only church attending, practicing Christian. Meaning that I went to church, I was active in church, I did a lot of things in church. And with 15 guys, I was the only church attending Christian. And there was something different about me. People used to say, my teammates used to say. And people used to always wonder, why don't you curse? Why don't you do this? Why are you missing out on this? Let's go club. Who's going to do this? And I would say no. And I remember there was one guy on the basketball team, the star player on the basketball team. His name was Adolfo Limas. He was a bright young man. He, he was a gangster. He was into some gang stuff, all that stuff. But every once in a while, every so often, he would ask me questions about the Bible, who Jesus is, what is your religion, where... Why do you guys do what you do on this? And oftentimes, I would change the subject, kind of veer away. Not because I'm ashamed, because I knew that God was trying to do something. He was trying to affirm me or do this thing, but I didn't want to be a pastor. I didn't want to be in all that. I just wanted to do what I wanted to do. And Adolfo then noticed that I wasn't really into speaking about it or talking about it. So he stopped asking me questions. I went to Oakwood, and I kept up with some of them on and off. When I went back home in California, I went back home. I went to my old high school, went to my old um, coach, and started talking to him, seeing how everybody's doing. The coach is like, man, when you left, a lot of things just happened. So-and-so got into this. So-and-so got into that. This and this happened, but Adolfo, Adolfo died. 
And I said, excuse me? He said, Adolfo died. And I said, what happened? Adolfo got frustrated with life. Adolfo got sad dealing with depression. Adolfo was dealing with demons and tried to drink them away. Adolfo committed suicide trying to find light. And I'll never forget the feeling that I got. Knowing that this man was trying to ask me questions, trying to find something. He saw there was something different about me, but I rejected him because I chose to put what I wanted instead of choosing the will of God. And I often wonder, maybe, just maybe, he could have been alive. I don't know. But had I placed myself in the will of God, stop running away from the call, stop trying to live your own life, stop trying to do what you think you should be doing, and do what God has called you to do, maybe things will be a little different. Church of the Oranges, I don't know what God has called you to do, but I know that you're called to send and spread the message of God. I know that it's not enough to just come here and sit and hear a word. I know that it's not enough. God didn't intend for us to just come and sit and do the word. God intended for us to cast out demons. God intended us for people to be saved. God intended us to do some big things. People ought to know the church of the oranges based off their works. But guess what? This building is not just a church. You are the church. And if you are the church and you're not operating in your will, in God's will, then what are you doing? Now, as a physical therapy major, I learned a lot of things. Things that go against the body are called diseases. So my question to you is, are you advancing the kingdom of God? Or are you a disease to the body of Christ? See, God has chosen you. God has appointed you. And God has anointed you. Yeah, you might not have this and that. Yes, you might be going through this and that. But God still has a plan for your life. And I don't know if there are some people in here who have veered away from the path of God. I want you to know it's never too late. I've dealt with the thing about my friend dying, but I always keep the, I always look up to God and I'm thankful that each and every day I have the opportunity to speak and live in his will. I might not have everything I want. I might not have the luxurious life that I thought I would have, but I'm doing what God wants me to do. And I've seen people being blessed. I've heard people come up to me, Tanashe, thank you so much for that message. Thank you so much for this. I've heard people come up to me and say, thank you for doing this. And it's not me doing it. It's the will and the spirit of God. It's not me. It's God. I know that there's some people in here who need to give their lives back to God. And say, God, I've been living my life trying to do what I wanted to do. But it's time for me to come back. And if that's you, I want you to stand. God... I've done this, I've done that, but it's time for me to do what you've called me to do. God, I've chosen this, I've chosen that. The enemy has tried to take me out. My family has forsaken me. People are putting me down. But today, I'm coming back and I'm going to do what you have called me to do. I'm asking you to just stand at this moment. Just stand at this moment. It doesn't matter how old you are, how young you are. Stand at this moment. Because I want to pray over your life. That you, will not, that you will stop living the life that you want to live. And do what God has called you to do. It's never too late to do what God has called you to do. Never. It's never too late. 
And then there are those in this house right now who just need Jesus in their lives. You've been attacked so much by the enemy doing what God has called you to do. And you feel like giving up. You're tired of people talking about you. You're tired of fighting to do this. You're tired of just so many things. And you feel like giving up. I need you to stand right now so that I can pray that God will continuously strengthen you. There are those people in here who have almost given up on church because you were discouraged by what people were saying to you. You had ideas about this. You had this and this about that. And you want to leave and go somewhere else or just stop to attend in period. I need, to, I need you to stand up right now so that I can pray for you. That you remember that you are a child of God and you operate under God's assignment, not humanity's assignment. I need you to stand right now. And then there are some young people in here who are still trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. You don't know what God is, wants you to do. You've been asking God to say and tell you what he wants you to do. You're confused because your family is telling you, be a nurse, be this, be a doctor. I need you to stand up right now that God will speak so clear to you that even if somebody tells you you got to do this, you would do what God tells you to do. I need you to stand up right now. There are some people in here who just simply need God in their lives. And I don't know what you're going through. You just need God to just show up in your life. Period. Nothing to do with being chosen. Nothing to do with that. You just need God. You're going through some things in your marriages, in your finances, in everything that you're doing. And you just need God. I need you to stand up right now. Stand up to your feet and declare, God, I need you right now. We're praying. God, you see the people in this building right now that are standing. You see the people who have been hurt by other people. You see the people who have been hurt by their families. You see the people who have been dealing with demons, dealing with things in their lives, dealing and running away from you, God. They have stood up right now to declare, God, that they will come back to you. They have stood up right now to declare, God, I need you in my life right now. They are standing up right now in declaration that, God, we are going to come back and do your will. Father, I pray for the youth in this house, the elderly in this house, the people who are trying to figure out what you want them to do with their lives. Father, open your mouth. And speak so clearly just as you did for Jesus, just as you did for Jeremiah, and just as you did for everybody else. Father, let them know that you can use them despite what they may have done in the past. For if God, you use Moses, who, who was a murderer, you can use them. If God, you can use the people who do bad things, you can use them. Let them know, God, that no matter what they've done, no matter where they're at in their lives, no matter how old they are, you will use them. But God, speak so clearly in their lives. Anoint them with an anointing that is so evident in their lives that people, when they see them, will say, that man is a man of God. That woman is a woman of God. That child is a child of God. There are some people in your God who just need you in their lives. I don't know what they're dealing with. Some people might be dealing with some things in their finances, and they need you to take control. Some people are dealing with some things in their schools, and they need you to take control. Take control, God. Some people are dealing with some things in their marriages, and they need you to take control. So take control, God. Some people are dealing with some things in their relationships, friendships. So take control, God. Some people are dealing with some addictions in their lives. Some people are trying to stop doing certain things and get better. So God, please take control. I pray, God, in a mighty and special way for those people who are looking to come back to you. For I know that the enemy is not happy. 
He's going to send enemies, people, and things to distract them and to confuse them. But God, I pray for those people that you will speak so clearly in their lives and that they will take heed and listen to what you say. Father, I pray for anointing for each and every person in this house, God. That you will pour that anointing. Let them know that they are the child of the most living God. That you love them. And that you care about them. That you have a deep love and appreciation despite how they look like. Let them know that you alone are the only one whose opinion is worthy. I also pray for protection for each and every child in this place. Each and every adult in this place. That God, you will protect them from the evil one. As we're getting closer to the end, to your soon coming. We know that the enemy is attacking us daily, in and out. I pray for your protection, God. That your angels will watch over them. That your angels will be around them. Will go before them. And prepare a way for them. But I pray, God, that we will stop living today as if we have eternity to live. I pray, God, that we will choose you and choose your work so that when you come again, you will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. I pray, God, that you will do the things that you have called us to do so that we may secure more people for your kingdom. This is my prayer, God, for the church of the oranges and those who have come to visit. This is my prayer for the young and elderly. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Let everybody say amen and amen.